have in for the very nice and uh, personal introduction. I appreciate that. He had my whole bio printed out, and I'm like, please don't read that. that it's boring, it's nice, but it's boring, and everybody already knows most of it anyway. So it's so great uh, for me to be here uh, among my uh, two colleagues who are going to give the other two talks, uh, Leah Curry from uh, Toyota and Jan Rader, uh, the fire chief in Huntington, where Jan, there she is. Uh, this is, uh, I think, a great way to look at a different spectrum of solutions to how do we meet the demands of the next generation workforce, how do we prosper in West Virginia, how do we, how do we make sure that um, everybody's moving in the right direction. So I want to thank you and the, uh, Amelia at the Educational Alliance and all the folks that you're working here and the sponsors as well. I think it gives a great opportunity for us to talk about what we're doing, but also to identify gaps and, and figure out ways to solve those problems. Uh, you're absolutely right, Kevin. There's one thing about West Virginians is we're used to solving problems, and we're, we don't hide, hide our heads in the sands. When we have a problem, we go out after it. And, uh, and so I'm sure we'll be identifying some of the issues. I, I do want to thank the sponsors, uh, and I, thank, I want to thank Brett Staples, who is the chair of the Ed Alliance, for being here today. Uh, I didn't see Mayor Scott Edwards this evening. He's getting that park all spruced up because he's having an event out there later today. Uh, and, and beyond that, I just want to thank all of you for attending. So when I was thinking about what to really talk about and how to frame it, and, and, and the, the media asked me, like, what is your role here? Well, as a federal representative, I think we have sort of the overarching view of the nation, but a lot of the decisions we can feed into and help fund and help uh, bring umbrella policies, but really a lot of the decisions are made at the local and state level, particularly in terms of education. And so um, I was uh, privileged to speak uh, on Friday to the Philip Barber High School, uh, and it was fun to see their, you know that, remember back to your high school graduation, you had all that hope and, and optimism and and energy and relief in some ways to be graduating from high school and they seemed ready to, to take it on. I was a little bit surprised when I asked the superintendent of the schools how many of these will be going on to higher education. He said about 30 percent. That seemed low to me. Uh, and But many of them came with sashes from the U.S. Army. Many of them were going to career technical school and had already been in career technical school and were going to be securing their jobs otherwise. Um, when I was in college, 750 years ago, um, I had a very different idea of what I thought I was going to do with my life, uh, and I tried to, tried to tell them about it. I was actually going to be a zoologist. I majored in zoology, and uh, people say, well, well, that's kind of a disconnect, because if you're majoring in zoology, what does that have to do with being in politics, and I said, well, it really prepared me to serve in the biggest zoo in America, <laughs> and, and that would be either Congress or Washington, D.C. I told the same thing to the students the other day, and what bothered me was their parents were clapping, and I don't know if they were clapping because they have so much frustration with what they see going on in Washington. I sort of think that's part of it. But I told the students, too, you know, just because you're moving in one direction doesn't mean you can't change. And life is a zig and a zag, and I zigged and zagged a couple times until I found what I really loved and where my passion was, and that was public service. Obviously, I was raised in it, but it uh, didn't quite hit me until I was uh, several years down the, down the road. So finding your own path is, is very, very uh, challenging. But, you know, we have so many things to offer here in West Virginia. You, know, you can have a traditional uh, four-year program at, at Marshall or, or WU or State or wherever you might go. You could go to a community college program. You could go to either certificate or associate's degree. There's uh, also our uh, career technical education aspects, our high schools. I mean, there's a lot of variety, I think, that we can do. But what I think where we're missing and where I think we've developed this skills gap, which I hear it all the time in our state and really the people in Washington, is we have a bunch of people coming out of school and we have a bunch of jobs ready to, to be filled but there's a gap between what's gone, what the knowledge experience has been with students coming out of high school or maybe career technical or college according to what the business community really wants to do. And I know this is what the charge of the Education Alliance is. 
is trying to meet that gap. Um, and so I see that we're doing a lot of things in West Virginia. I know that Toyota, and I'm sure you'll have a program that has a program to try to meet that challenge uh, in, in conjunction with, with the community college. And I know it's been uh, used as a, an example for the rest of the nation as to how successful it can be. Uh, I also talk about the STEM in Washington. We're doing a lot to try to incent uh, science, technology, energy, math. And since Randall reads here, I'll put arts in. Where is he? <laughs> yes, that's for you. And uh, but I do think uh, I, I'm tongue in cheek there. Arts is uh, very important. But so STEM or STEAM. Uh, women and minorities are very much underrepresented and underrepresented in the STEM and STEAM fields. So I've joined with my other women, uh, members of Congress, Republicans and Democrats, to try to figure out a way to incent and to build these programs at the elementary and junior high and high school level to, uh, to get our young people involved in STEM. And there's a lot of nonprofits that are working in this area too, say the Girl Scouts or 4-H, Boy Scouts, other areas to try to meet that challenge of exciting people about STEM. And what's so exciting about STEM? Because for me, STEM means that you're going to be able to have a job that not only carries you for the next few years, but can carry you for the next few generations. And has some flexibility to be able to change with the times and acquire more education at the same time. So we've introduced several bills to try to help with the STEM issue. I think uh, those mostly federal dollars are coming in and through the state through the Department of Ed to try to help with that, and I'm encouraged by that. But at the same time, when we're talking about a skills gap, we've also got to recognize that we need people to teach the skills. So some of these are more up-and-coming kinds of uh, occupations that maybe uh, haven't traditionally been taught in the schools. Maybe it's coding or programming and all these uh, more higher-tech jobs. To try to find the instructors it can be a challenge because most people who are in these fields are working and they're making a, a good living and they're satisfied with the, the future that they have. So with Tim Kane from Virginia, uh, we, I introduced the Quali uh, Creating Quality Technical Educators Act, which, is, which addresses the career and technical education teacher, teacher shortage. It would create a teacher residency grant program to help recruit and train CTE teachers who could help their students obtain the education and the skills that they need not only to succeed but to excel. So we're working uh, with that for our workforce development. I have some frustrations with the workforce development programs that we have at the federal level. And I don't know how many of y'all in the audience are working directly with those. But we have like 45 workforce development programs. To me, why do we need 45, number one? Because that just diffuses the dollars into a lot of different areas and are they really working together and so I've talked with the Secretary of Labor who does a lot of the workforce development and, and, and have told him express my concerns about this let's look at consolidating maxing out the dollars as they're moving into this workforce development we do have a lot of dollars in West Virginia under power grants which is retraining our coal miners and retraining those who have lost their jobs we do have uh, availabilities of agriculture and microagriculture that's coming on in workforce development. We do have a lot of things in STEM, as I mentioned. Um, but if we're, if we're sort of doing one thing here, 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 we're really not getting, a, number one, a good bang for the buck, but what is our end product at the same time and what are those statistics bearing out? So I've encouraged him to really look at those programs in a microscope. I'm not saying get rid of any of the dollars, certainly not. I'm saying let's make sure that we're really focused in on the jobs of tomorrow. So I get a lot of visitors in Washington. It's great. Many of you visited me there, and I appreciate it. Um, and it really makes me excited. I'm going to use an example from West Virginia University. We went down to Hometown um, Elementary uh, to visit several years ago to visit their uh, robotics program. They had a robotics program, and I think it was in the fourth grade. And they were building a little, um, listen to me, a little robotic thing, a little car or something. <laughs> I'm not a big techie, as you can tell. A little thing, and uh, you know how to control it and using using the technology. And the kids were so excited because they were in teams, they were working together. Uh, we know that we can't do this alone. You mentioned that in your in your beginning uh, statements. 
It's all about working as a team, and they're already teaching them how to work as a team, as a robotics team. So then you fast forward into higher ed, even really, this is a master's and, and PhD level, up at West Virginia University. They have a very vigorous robotics program, and what they're doing is they are uh, perfecting, they've entered several contests that have won, which is exciting because it always has a cash award for it, but it's, they are looking at creating robots that are going to be deployed into space. Think about space. Space is different than what it was when we were here. It was NASA and the astronauts when I was growing up. Now it's private, uh, private space exploration and all kinds of satellites. So WVU is going to commercialize, once they get it all solidified, uh, how to send a robot up into space to repair a satellite rather than just let the satellite keep circling around and eventually become dysfunctional or, or be, a, be of no use. So for people in the high tech and AT&T, that's good news. Because rather than to have a deploy a new satellite, to be able to fix your old satellite to the new technology has a lot of promise. So these things that we start in elementary school have a direct impact on where you end up and how you can end up and how exciting it can be for, for your future. Um, I was interested, uh, two or three weeks ago, I was invited to attend dinner at the president's daughter's house, Ivanka Trump and her husband, Jared Kushner. And uh, I went for a lot of different reasons. So certainly, they were all policy reasons. I didn't want to see her house or anything. But, uh, in any event, um, they were very nice. And, and, and it, there were probably only about 12 of us there, uh, five members of the Senate, uh, a, some of the White House personnel, and then two really titans of industry, Jenny Remedy, who is the CEO of IBM, a woman CEO. Uh, and uh, Wes Bush, who is the uh, CEO for Northrop Grumman, who is actually a Morgantown native. Many of you have probably he's come, come and talked in the Valley before. And their whole, uh, the whole point of the dinner was to discuss um, the Perkins Act, which helps to fund career technical education, and impressing upon us how important it is that we do this. But to hear from the two CEOs about the the skills gap and how they've got, in, in Wes Bush's case, thousands of jobs that they can't fill, which is just amazing to me to think that this really is, is, is the way it is, but it's, it is true. And he's projecting into the future and he's frustrated by it. And then you hear at IBM, what they're doing is much like what Toyota is doing. They just taken the bull by the horns and they're going right into the schools themselves. And they call their program at IBM, I believe they call it not blue collar jobs, not white collar jobs, but new collar jobs. And that's probably an industry term, but to me, it, it's, I think it's creative thinking in one way to think about how, how are you gonna describe these new jobs. But I think it, it also, I think, shows that these kind of jobs, they're not really saying, oh, you gotta have a college education, or you don't have to have a college education. They're sort of saying, you can have it either or, it can, you know, it can runs the gamut. And that's what I think the new collar jobs are about. So I'm happy to report as a result of that dinner that we had that we are moving forward on the Perkins reauthorization. Hopefully we'll get that done in the next several months, it, 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 several weeks. It is something we can do bipartisan. We ought to give a shout out for that. Uh, we won't get all quarrelsome and bickering about it, not that we ever do that about anything else, but, uh, and I think it, it, it really shows, I think, our dedication to helping solve the skills gap, helping the create the jobs of tomorrow and helping create the workforce of tomorrow. So hopefully um, that will be something that will come out. You know, we have to have all the tools. When I've talked a lot about technology, I've talked a lot about what we're teaching in schools and, and what the business community might expect. But for me, as a policymaker here in our state, what I expect is to have the infrastructure so that our students and our businesses can thrive. And we don't. We do not have the backbone, the internet connectivity that we have got to have to be successful. And I talk about this all the time. I started my Capito Connect plan to try to shine a uh, spotlight on this. I've started the Senate uh, Broadband Caucus, which is a bipartisan broadband caucus. Even, even states that you don't think wouldn't have connectivity, like uh, New York. New York's got a lot of rural areas. It's really an urban and rural divide. And we're, we've fallen behind. 
I mean, if you think about what Chief Rader has to do in her in her job, or or Leah Curry's doing in Toyota, without connectivity, she can't respond to an emergency properly. She, you know, you, you can't create the next manufactured Toyota vehicle as precisely as you need to. So there's all kinds of ramifications to brought, and I am just beating this drum constantly to to the point where. I think, I think there's an old saying that when you, if you keep talking about something long enough and people get tired of hearing it, that means you're really sinking in. So I'm going to keep talking about it because when I think about where connectivity is important, it's in the business and economics area. It's in the education space. It's in uh, the healthcare space with telehealth. It's in the tourism space. I learned this. People want to disconnect when they travel. But when they come back to their cabin up in Fayetteville, they want to have connectivity so they can stream their uh, or, or do some of their work while they're, while they're on vacation. Agriculture, apparently precision agriculture, these massive farms out in the mid, in the mid, uh, part, mid part of our state, or of our country. Uh, you know, Farmer Joe's like five miles from, from where he's talking to somebody who, uh, who is um, helping him decide how much how much seed, fertilizer, and everything. If he can dial that in on while he's out on the tractor, he saves time, money, energy, and probably has a better product at the same time. So there's innumerable things that, that go back to connectivity, but I think there's nothing more pertinent to connectivity than the link between connectivity, technology, education, and the next generation jobs. And so I'm going to keep that as a difference that I can make. It's a measurable difference. And I'm working every day to try to close that, close that gap, and we're working on it uh, together. One of the uh, last things I'll say is we have to have a healthy workforce. This is a challenge in our state. We see it every day with our friends and, and families. We see it um, on the news. And we see people who are heroically trying to, on the ground, on the ground floor, like Chief Raider is, try to solve some of these very difficult problems. But I am committed to making sure that our next generation, that we, that we beat this, that we beat the opioid and addiction crisis, that we help those children who are now, there's a thousand more children in foster care than there were last year in the state of West Virginia alone. We have, Capital Huntington has um, a lot of uh, specialty who's uh, Children's Hospital has the neonatal units where we're seeing babies that are born. And we don't really know what the long-term what the long-term uh, ramifications of this are yet for those children. And there's a lot of great education that's going on to try to educate and prevent. And, and I know Capital County's working on this as well. There's also Lily's Place, obviously, in Huntington to try to meet the challenge. Uh, but this is this is not just about health. This is about workforce. This is about working jobs. We, I'm on a bill that would say, with Sherrod Brown from Ohio, actually, who said, you know, we, we visited, all of us visited recovery centers, and when you go there, after you get out of recovery, where are you going to go? Who's going to hire you? How are you going to get hired? And, and, and you, you've lost your confidence, and you, you've been in a spiraling kind of situation. So you're in a situation where you're, you're, you're being successful with your recovery, you're ready to go. And you still have so many roadblocks. So Sherry Brown and I worked on a transitional, where, which would help us move us from, from that treatment into, into the job so that you have skills prepared so that you're ready to begin work. Because a lot of these things start young and education out the door. Many people aren't educated. But they're definitely, you know, they, they saw, yeah, I've heard Evan Jenkins say many times, a job solves a lot of problems. And a good job solves even so I, I want to be the partner that helps with this meeting the challenge of this crisis. I tell my friends who are in unaffected states, senators from unaffected states, if we don't solve this problem in West Virginia and Ohio and in New Hampshire where it's really hitting, it's going to be in North Dakota. It's going to be in South Dakota. It's going to be in Montana, some of the areas where it's not as uh, in, in large numbers. So, so help us, and they're enlisted in this, help us figure this out because it's a spectrum of solutions and it's very difficult. So I just want to thank everybody for everything you do every day to help. I want to be your partner in, in trying to, I visit schools all the time. I visited a school, two schools in the northern panhandle 
about three weeks ago with my Girls Rise Up program. I'm probably at the end of my time, but I'll talk about it for just a minute. Because, uh, as you know, I was, uh, my father was very prominent in, in the state of West Virginia. And the best things I get to hear about him are he helped me with, he helped me find my son when he was in Vietnam. He helped me immigrate here in the 60s. He helped us get Little League lights on the field. You know, small things. It wasn't that he voted for the civil rights. It's small things. And so I thought, what, what would I like to kind of pass on? And being the first woman senator, what I'd like to pass on is a, this sort of a legacy of public service for our young women. And I would like somebody to come up to my daughter someday and say, your mother came to my fifth grade class and she was a United States senator. And I thought, that's pretty cool. I want to do that. So I've been going around to fifth grade classes with my Girls Rise Up program to talk about education, physical well-being, and self-confidence to inspire that next generation of leadership. And when I went to the, uh, the uh, Northern Panhandle most recently, I had a female astronaut with me. I mean, she was, a, that's almost like walking around with Jan Rayer, only maybe <laughs> not. <laughs> but this woman, she had 10 moon walks, uh, or 10 um, uh, space walks. She'd been the longest in space. She was just, so, and she said, she, they asked her, how did you decide that you wanted to be a, an astronaut? And she said, when I was in third grade, my class watched the first person walk on the moon. So education is the key. And from that point on, she worked with her educators to say, that's what I want to do. How do I do it? How do I do it? And so, I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm ready and willing and able and, uh, and listed in this because West Virginia's next generation, I now am up to six grandchildren, so I'm reliving school now for the third time, and uh, it's much different, and I was so pleased because our oldest granddaughter asked for her favorite topic in school, and she told me something I never had, technology. So, all right, we're winning this for. All right, thank you all very much.